Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back to part four of our talks on the anterior mediastinum. And I think this is going to be the final part. I've showed you a lot of information. I've shown you lots of cases. And I'd like to show you a few more different topics. We left off with lymphoma. And again, I just want to make the point that if I show you this case, depending on the patient's age and history, lymphoma is a great thought. But if you said from this image alone, thymoma, you would be correct. It's not going to be teratoma. It's not going to be thyroid. It could be metastatic disease if you had a patient with renal cell carcinoma, perhaps. But soft tissue density, lobular masses, some infiltration, lymphoma, and thymoma is really where I think about things. When you see disease going between more further downward or in the abdomen, I mentioned, that pushes you to lymphoma. So this was a good example of B-cell lymphoma, though somewhat challenging, okay? So again, think about this when you do your differential diagnosis. And here's the same case with the coronal view. Again, anterior metastinal mass, soft tissue density, no significant vascularity, and very nicely shown in the sagittal view. It abuts the chest wall and it abuts the aorta, pushes on a bit, but there's no invasion. I think in terms of invasion, thymoma would be more likely statistically than lymphoma, though both of them can be very, very aggressive. Okay, just some nice additional images showing you the full extent of disease. Now, large cell lymphoma can infiltrate, as in this case, the thymus, so yes, there is a thymic mass present, and no, it's not thymic carcinoma, and no, it's not thymoma, because you see the hyaluratinopathy in the subcarinal nodes. Now you can say, yes, if I only saw the anterior metastinum, in theory, lymphoma and thymoma can look similar, but that's typically a theoretical problem and not a practical problem because most cases lymphoma will really help you out in terms of the appearance, as in this case, showing you the adenopathy and showing you the process in the um, subcarinal region as well. This patient also had consolidation in the right lower lungs as well as adenopathy, tracking down along the region of the posterior metastinum, which is something that's not uncommon with lymphoma, but it's just not going to happen in a patient with thymoma. It's just a really nice example. There's some narrowing of the left main stem bronchus, and we know that adenopathy can compress and narrow the bronchi, and that's simply, typically, due to mass effect. So just a very nice example. Here are some of the coronal views. Now what about this case? This looks like a large aggressive tumor. It's cystic and necrotic. Could it be a thymoma? Absolutely. Could it be lymphoma with necrotic nodes, eccentric? Absolutely large mass. It's not a teratoma. Could it be metastatic? Possibly. Could it be something coming from the heart? Definitely a possibility. We've seen a few angiosarcomas involve the right ventricle where they typically originate. Could, that, could it be that? You can see here that this tumor infiltrates downward, involves the pericardium, right? You see a pleural effusion very nicely defined as well. And on the coronal view is really an aggressive looking tumor more aggressive than many of the lymphomas we see surely on its enhancement, the solid and the more cystic components, the increased vascularity. And this is pet-avid, which is many things from thymoma to lymphoma to metastasis, all could be that possibility, including cardiac tumors. Again, you can see the extent very nicely. But when you look at the uh, pet in its entirety, it's only this large mass. We don't see anything in the abdomen or the pelvis. Still could be lymphoma, but maybe less likely. And this was biopsy. This was a very unfortunate case. This was a patient who had Hodgkin's lymphoma, had bone marrow transplant and radiation therapy 17 years earlier. And now the patient came back, and this was initially felt to be recurrent lymphoma, which is a typical but can occur, right, even 17 years later. On biopsy, it was a sarcoma, an undifferentiated sarcoma felt to be secondary to radiation therapy. So 
When patients do recur, I'm not going to speak about the recurrence of lymphoma or thymoma and the patterns, but when you have a mediastinal mass in a patient who's had radiation therapy, always think about the possibility of radiation-induced sarcomas, and we've seen several of these. Now, in this last part, I also want to talk about some of the pitfalls. Sometimes masses that arise outside the anterior mediastinum can be confused with mediastinal tumors. So something arising in the chest wall or sternum, and chondrosarcoma or osteosarcoma, which can be due to prior radiation therapy or not. Processes that are vascular, especially when related to trauma, mediastinal hematoma, for example, look at the aorta, make sure there's no dissection. And there are some unusual processes which infiltrate around the vessels, kind of a vasculitis type appearance, and at times can look very similar, if you only look at it from a very focused area, to uh, um, infiltrating process like lymphoma. And one example will be Ernheim-Chester disease. So here's a patient with a large anterior mediastinal mass, Again, calcifications, you can think about things, but where is this beginning? Is this invading the chest wall or arising from the chest wall? There's lots of coarse matrix here, and this was a chondrosarcoma. Okay, chondrosarcoma arising from the chest wall, growing posteriorly. I've seen osteosarcoma as well. It may be due to things like radiation therapy previously, like I showed you the sarcoma, and osteosarcoma and chondrosarcomas can be related to prior radiation therapy. But in this case, there was no radiation therapy, and this was a primary chondrosarcoma. Again, we see thymoma or lymphoma can involve the anterior chest wall, but it's pretty unusual. And this is a lot of calcification for either thymoma or lymphoma. So you gotta think about some type of sarcoma. Could it be a teratoma? I guess the calcifications make you think about it, but there's no fat. And then there's also the extension, very nicely seen here, into the anterior mediastinum. So just a really nice example of a chondrosarcoma. And here's some of the 3D imaging, which shows it very nicely as well. So again, something to think about. We've seen plasma cytomas in the sternum growing backwards. So that's another possibility. Now, what about trauma? I mentioned trauma as a mimicker. Here's a large mass, but you can see it's high density. And then if you look carefully, there's actually bleeding from the internal mammary artery. This patient had trauma, and that's the reason uh, the patient had injury to the internal mammary artery with a large anterior mediastinal bleed. Again, this patient will go to surgeries potentially or embolization depending on what concurrent injuries there are. But a really nice example of blood. And so again, typically you're gonna have the history. Sometimes the history, the patient's maybe was driving illegally and doesn't wanna say anything. But this looks like blood and you can see the act of bleeding. And short of a biopsy, nothing's gonna cause bleeding from the internal mammary arteries like that. Very nicely shown on the sagittal and coronal view as well. Another patient with MVA with chest pain. Well, you can see there's lots of fluid representing blood in the anterior mediastinum, and then there's a regularity in this younger patient in the aorta. This is a classic example of not a mediastinal mass, but blood in the mediastinum, secondary to vascular injury from trauma. You can see the laceration of the aorta. This patient was very lucky because most of these patients will die before they make it to the hospital. Here, the patient's blood was causing tamponade. This patient went to surgery. They put an endovascular stent in. Look at the extent. Look at the extent of the bleed tracking into the abdomen. But look at the laceration right by the ductus region. Very classic for traumatic injury from MVA. Often a sternal fracture, as in this case, you can see the sternal fracture is associated with the injury. You can see the sternal fracture here. You can see the laceration here, the blood. But this patient was able to go to surgery, was stented, and the patient did fine. A very lucky patient taking a 
really horrific accident and managing to survive. But a very nice example showing you the last couple cases that blood from trauma can be confusing with the mediastinal mass in select cases. But again, history as well as other findings, seeing active bleeding makes it very easy. Here's that same patient with volume rendering. And again, here's some more volume rendering showing you that laceration. And here's the cinematic rendering, again, showing you the laceration. Uh, cinematic rendering is especially good for vascular processes, really seeing lacerations, really seeing areas of involvement. Again, very nicely shown in this set of images. And I do like this case. You can see by the range of images. And again, key thing, make the diagnosis and get that patient off the table and have them go to surgery. So very nice example, transection, but the patient survived in a large bleed. Here was a patient rule out the section. It looks like a mass or a clot in the anterior metastinum by the right ventricle. What exactly is going on there? Well, this was a spindle cell sarcoma of the right ventricle. Remember I mentioned before I showed you a case and said, could this be primary cardiac? So sometimes cardiac tumors, whether it's a spindle cell sarcoma, which is rare, an angiosarcoma perhaps, can arise and grow forward and grow upward and simulate an anterior metastinal mass. Remember, lymphoma and even thymomas can invade the heart, so it can be tricky, but the epicenter for these cardiac tumors really is the heart, and in this case, you can see it very nicely that it's the patient right ventricle, particularly as you look at some of the more inferior scans. Very nicely shown in the sagittal, and also it's a bit lower the epicenter of the process. And again, here's just some more views showing you that as well. So again, a nice sarcoma. And again, in that differential diagnosis, you need to be thinking about that because particularly when these tumors get large, there can be infiltration or extension. And again, the differential between this and lymphoma can indeed be very critical, knowing what and where to biopsy. Very nicely shown in this example. And again, a few more images just giving you the full extent of the disease process. Now, another patient. Here you see chest pain, and it looks like something infiltrating the subclavian, the left carotid, and the uh, aorta in the arch. Could this be lymphoma infiltrating? Now, the patient has chest pain, but no trauma, so we're going to leave trauma out. I showed you the last few cases with trauma, but what's going on here? Well, you see this infiltration around the aorta and the vessels, but there's no trauma, because you can look at this and say, could this be a bleed? You also see the process is going down, and the process is in the abdomen, very nicely shown by the celiac and SMA and by the renal arteries. So now I have a process infiltrating the mediastinum and the abdomen. Could this be lymphoma? Well, it's possible. The epicenter is more middle mediastinum than anterior mediastinum, perhaps. But then when you get into the abdomen, you can see around the kidneys this infiltration. And yes, you could say, well, maybe it's lymphoma. Lymphoma gives perirenal space involvement. But if I go backwards, that appearance of the arch the involvement of the left subclavian, the infiltration and extension. I want you to see this in its full extent and then the perirenal involvement. That's something you see with Ernheim chester disease. I mentioned about vascular processes. Ernheim chester is one of them. The aorta is commonly involved. Ascending aorta and arch can be very bulky infiltration. That involvement around the kidney, the perinephric space, is very common indeed. And so we talk about the vascular involvement, again, potentially being a mimicker of other infiltrating processes like lymphoma. And the renal changes, which could be lymphoma as well, but when you look at the changes in the aorta and the kidney region, then Ernheim chester becomes the preferred diagnosis. So we've gone through a lot of things. We spoke about mediastinal widening as a jumping point. Lymphoma, 
teratoma, thymoma, seminoma. We talk about other things, vascular. We talk about mediastinitis. We went through a range of processes, but it all goes back most of the time, starting with those three T's and an L. Think about those possibilities, kind of work through them, thyroid growing down, vascular, solid, thymus, the range of patterns, eccentric, teratoma, the presence of fat and calcification, and lymphoma involvement of anterior mediastinum, but commonly hilum and middle mediastinum, as well as possibly going to the abdomen. So that's a lot of information. Hopefully this is going to be helpful. And a lot of it, you believe it or not, hasn't changed in these 30 years, but a lot has. The images are a whole lot better. So concluding the anterior mediastinum is involved in a wide range of pathologies that need to be approached with a logical plan. And I hope I've shared that with you. Certain processes have unique features, while there are other findings that overlap and we hope our approach is helpful in your practice. And with that, thank you very much and have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.